Great. So um, I guess uh, a lot of people are feeling a bit fragile at the moment. So I'm going to start by playing just the beginning of this um, this gorgeous um, Schumann piano piece, um, which has uh, set me on a journey into Schumann, which has been quite surprising in many ways, because it's not just about Robert, it's, it's, it's about Clara and about the scientific circles that Clara was mixing in, partly because of her stepmother, um, who she didn't get on with that much, but, um, but that introduced introduces a whole load of fascinating scientific figures. But just let's listen to uh, Schumann's prophetic bird for a bit to calm us all down. Um, so what I'm interested in is I'm going to talk about appoggiaturas and really, so I'm talking about the first notes, you, you know, this, why is it that, um, that first note, which obviously is not part of the G minor chord, it, it has this tendency to want to move upwards to the D and then, and, and that whole dynamic of, of this leaning. And of course the word poggiatura means to lean um uh, informs that whole piece but in in many senses um the idea of a tendency the idea of something that's moving towards something underpins the whole of music i think the the other curious thing to mention on the left hand side of uh, this slide i've got um a picture if you look up um auguries in Wikipedia, because this this is what Schumann was referring to when he was writing about um, bird as prophet, um, which was this ancient idea that you would listen to the birds uh, for signals about what was to come, um, as a, because somehow birds had some sort of premonition as to what was coming. It's, it's kind of uh, under uh, given what's just happened, uh, you, you wonder what the birds might have told us. But anyway. So, so that's that's another aspect, but there's some that that indicates some degree of spiritual holism, some some unity in nature, and maybe the birds have some uh, privileged position in terms of being able to um, tell us something about that. The holism, I think, is really interesting, and that's that's what I really want to address. Um. So appoggiaturas are about leaning, and leaning automatically makes you think, well, it's it's it must be to do with gravity. And in fact, it's interesting because I was thinking, well, there there are many musical terms which um, implicitly uh, refer to gravity. You can think of cadence, for example, you know, falling. Um, but but the idea of leaning is very explicitly gravitational, and I've, I've got a little example here to just show you. Um, I've been playing around with ChatGPT. It makes wonderful things. There, there's a bit of leaning. So there's my there's my appoggiatura, a nice long one. Do it again. So that's that's kind of curious, really, because we tend to think that when people use 
uh, terminology in music, which comes somehow has a physical resonance. It's a metaphor. But increasingly, um, scientists, phys physicists, biologists, John Torday, who's here, um, uh, Roger Penrose, who's uh, who wrote this uh, uh, thing, this, this Schrodinger's lump thing, physicists and scientists have been saying that maybe there actually is a causal connection. There is a causal connection between um, the leaning of a note, the, uh, the the way that we experience falling and um, uh, uh, other physical sensations. There is a direct connection between our feelings and the the, the way physics works, and um, and that's really what I, that's the theme of what I'm going to talk about. So it's, it is that direct connection and as part of that then we have to consider the nature of perception because we perceive the c sharp to um to lean against the d and what is in our perception that causes that to happen and you kind of think well there must be um Gravity is part of the fundamental structure of the universe. It's, it's, there, so there must be some relation between the fundamental structure of the universe and our perception of things having tendencies to move in particular directions. And here's another little um, chat GPT driven uh, thing that I created. So here is a structure of the universe. It's fixed. But of course, if I want to know about it, I can move in on it and I can move it around and I can get different perspectives. And and this is actually what we do in the world itself. This is how we move around the world to perceive things as they are. And it's very closely related to the theory of perception by James Gibson. Uh, I've got a little uh, diagram here where he talked about the way that um, animals particularly, but all of us, um, when we perceive anything, it's it's a, an active process. It's a process of getting all kinds of different information, moving ahead, getting a different perspective. Um, now, that's something that biology does in relation to an environment that there is an, a, a, a structure to the environment that we're in. The environment doesn't necessarily change, but we change. We change in our, our position. And in doing that, we construct something, we construct an understanding, we construct a story, perhaps. Um, and associated with that is the idea that perhaps the structure of reality is in some way uh, essential, some way fixed. And maybe where we get some glimpse of this, these two pictures on the left-hand side, one, the first one is by um, uh, associated with a, a thing called um, the Merian Project, um, uh, a lady called Lynn Claire Dennis um, has uh, been delving into the nature of perception following a near-death experience that she had. And during this near-death near experience, she had a vision of geometry. And she's been working with um, mathematician Lou Kaufman um, and exploring, well, how is it that this geometry might be related to the structure of reality? And But it's not just there. This is also coming up, people reporting, seeing geometric patterns under the influence of DMT, for example. And so that's that's a sort of DMT type drawing there as well. So there, there's something, there's something strange about, or something strange in our relation, our perceived relation to the structure of the world that we're in. And I, my proposition is really that music somehow allows us to get sort of some sort of glimpse of this. And maybe one of the things that happens is as we move around um, whatever structure that we find ourselves in, um, and we create many different uh, perspectives, many different uh, perceptions of what it might be, maybe one of the things that we do is make up time. We make up a story. And that this process is somehow related to the deep structure of um, the universe. And this is very interesting because it takes us back to something that I know Michael's interested in, the, the sort of organicism, which was so dominant in the thinking about art um, at the beginning of the 19th, uh, well, during the 19th century. 
and which um just going to move that that which would say basically that everything is imminent everything is the, the last note of beethoven's ninth is in the first note and somehow there's this unfolding process that was the essence of uh, 19th century organicism we've seen a process where that's really given way to a, a more sort of cultural historical view of music uh, as situated within culture so it becomes everything becomes more culturally um, oriented and there are you know that's very interesting but there are certain aspects of fundamental musical experience which that doesn't account for and and i know michael's been asking um are arguing for this and i agree that actually the, the 19th century people they weren't organic enough we need more organicism and maybe we need some physics and and i i, I think this this is an important um issue really and Deep down, um, maybe as we become more organic and more physical, we realize that there is no beginning or ending to anything. Um, we construct our idea of the beginning and an ending, and we construct the journey. But deep down, there's a kind of self-reference, much more like this, um, the, you know, an ancient idea of the Ouroboros, the, the snake eating its own tail, that, that it, it, we're dealing with self-reference in music. And so um, this leaning of the appoggiatura is happening in time that we are constructing. And that's very interesting because if you think about music, well, music begins with silence. It begins, you might say that's nothing. It, it ends with nothing. It has to end at some point. It goes on a kind of journey. It does something in the middle as it searches and, and explores whatever it's, it's unfolding. But it's directed again, eventually, to making nothing, to, to getting to the end. And one um, idea that emerges from that is that maybe nothing is a structure. Nothing is the structure. So nothing is, this is nothing. Our perception of it isn't necessarily nothing, because obviously as we move around it, we, we are seeing something. But actually, the structure itself could be a representation of nothing. And this really takes me very close to um, Peter Rowland's physics, and I'm very pleased that Peter's here. Um, it's also very interesting that composers have made some very remarkable comments, I think, about this. Bert Whistle particularly, he was very clear about his compositional process, and he said, well, it's like a sculpture. You're moving th through a sculpture, um, but your perception of it changes, but you're twisting it and turning it and looking at it, looking at it from different angles. And of course, that very much applies to his music, but I, I wonder if it applies more broadly. I've written about this, and um, so this is the first paper I wrote, which is actually how I got to know Michael. Um, I wrote with uh, a very um, famous economist called Lote Leidersdorf, who was also interest, deeply interested in music, who sadly is no longer with us. Um, and, um, and more recently, I've written a, a paper for John Torday's um, journal as well. Um, so this has been a bit, a bit of an obsession, and my my thinking is uh, emerging. Um, you go from one paper to the next, I guess, and I probably need to write this one up. Um, anyway, so the the real issue at stake, and and this is the issue which I'm going to connect Clara Schumann to, is perception, and and the reason why perception is so interesting, particularly in relation to Clara Schumann, is because the science of perception grew up in the 19th century. And it was a real challenge to the prevailing philosophy, uh, particularly the sort of, um, well, both the sort of Kantian um, uh, philosophical school, which said, well, we, we're constructing the world. Um, and there's there's not much that we can't really apprehend the thing in itself. Um, we can only, we can, we only have our own constructs to, to um, deal with. Well, the, the scientists who were looking at perception were saying, no, actually, there's something that there is a relation between um, the world outside and our perception of the world outside, and we can prove it. Um, so as we engage, let's say we're engaging with a structure, we're engaging with something which is of a different kind of dimensionality to the dimensionality of what we're able to perceive. And you can think about it a bit like it's like a, in, in physics, they talk about 
the event horizon near a black hole, which is where the physics of the the, the sheer intense gravitational force means that there is there are constraints onto what you can see and what you can't see, um, because the light itself is sucked into the black hole, and and it's a bit like that with our moving through some kind of physical structure. So if you have a physical, if you have a structure, I shouldn't say physical structures. That implies that it's something. Um, it's like a you know temple or something, but it's not. It's but it, it's nothing which is a structure, and you can move through it, and we get a perceptual glimpse of it, but it's not the whole thing. Um, and so, and because we can't see the whole thing, we have to make up time as a story to tell ourselves about this is what reality is. And it's a little bit like these these optical illusions, the, the Necker cube, um, the, the different ways that you can see whether that's a cube coming out at us or a cube moving away from us. And of course, you can draw impossible ones like the one on the right-hand side there as well. And and I've made the point that this structure that we're moving through, it has components which are scalars. So a scalar is something big or small. It's got no direction. There are vectors. Well, uh, a message is a vector. It, it moves from, it's, it's a signal which goes from one point to another. So it has, di it has direction, excuse me. And then you can have different orders of vectors. So you can have a vector in two dimensions. So you can have one direct one vector, which may be um, uh, constraining or coordinating another vector in a different direction. So you can think about grammar a bit like that. And then you can actually look at vectors between as, as sort of between entities. So vectors uh, which are uh, effectively uh, spaces coordinating the movements or interactions between spaces. Um, and this, this dimensionality is something that our perception isn't really geared up to see. And that, I, I submit, is why we make up stories like, you know, this is the journey, this is the time. We can't see the thing as it really is. Um, I've got, um, I'm going to, uh, so I've done some work with the Schumann piece and I'm going to play you, um, not the Schumann piece as you would normally hear it. I've stripped out everything, but the noise, everything, but the sort of, um, the, the, the all the thumping on the keyboard and, uh, all of that stuff, which is Obviously, if you take that stuff away from music, it's, it kind of loses its life. But it's interesting just to listen to the noise. So I'm going to play that. And then I'm just going to show you sort of visualization of the different vectors. So here we go. These are the thump. This is thumping on the piano. You can hear it. So there's the noise. Now, actually, what you're not hearing, although you hear a bit perhaps, is the notes. You hear them every now and then. They come in. You hear something about the structural constraints, the grammar, the, the way the thing repeats itself. And of course, in terms of the coordination, there is something that's familiar. There is something that we all recognize in this as well as to it. But these are different orders of dimension. Now, it is really interesting to think and to look at the analysis you can do just with the noise. So um, I want to talk very briefly about Peter's work. So uh, uh, Peter's uh, spent his career uh, rewriting the laws of physics in a really remarkable way. And um, it is his, uh, his work which says that the structure of reality Remember I said with the music is like you start with nothing, you end up with nothing, but nothing has a structure. Well, yes, Peter would say, nothing does have a structure and it's structured in terms of these vectors. So between a bit of vectors and scalars, you have scalars, vectors, bivectors, trivectors, and together they make nothing. And I'm not gonna go into the mathematics as to how he makes nothing out of vectors and scalars, but believe me, it works. And this is such a powerful idea because if you can make nothing, 
then you can start from nothing and think, well, how do we get how do we get the impression of there being something? And why is it that having got the impression of there being something, we end up with nothing again, and the something has a tendency towards nothing again? And it's really to do with something which comes out of quantum mechanics, which is the relationship between what is considered to be local. So local is, here's my coffee cup, I'm going to have a drink. Um, and what is non-local, which is what's going on in the cosmos. And of course, the quantum mechanics uh, scientists will tell us, well, there is a relation and we can prove it because we can see the what they call the entanglement between particles in a local setting and a non-local setting, that there is there is what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. And of course, what's behind that? Well, we're still we're still beginning to unravel this stuff. We've, we'd known about this science for, what, 100 years or so, not quite. Um, but maybe in the scheme of human evolution, um, given that we managed not to blow ourselves up in the next four years, um, maybe that's not a very long time. So there's a long way to go. But this relationship between the local and the non-local is is very interesting, very important. Now, one way of uh, thinking about this is you can think that our local perception, in combination with the non-local cosmos, is always zero. That totality of local and non-local is always zero. Try to draw it here. I've got a little... little um, Oh, now, where has it gone? Here it is. Uh, and it's interesting because also, you know, we're moving in the world. We're doing crazy things. We're electing lunatics as presidents of powerful countries. We're doing all of these things. Everything that we do in the world is somehow in the context of a non-local world, which is also changing, developing, universe expanding, all of those things. And if you took any snapshot of the totality, it will always be zero doesn't matter how many lunatics you elect in the world. The totality is always zero. However, locally, it might tend to zero, but sometimes it doesn't feel like it. And um, and that's because we can tie ourselves in knots in, in, in all sorts of ways. In our relation with the universe, we don't necessarily listen to, um, to our being. In a, in a in a fundamental way but perhaps we should and perhaps what's happening is telling us that we must so uh here's a bit of analysis um so the the noise that you've just heard i analyzed for the entropy so that is the the rate of change or the degree of change um every second um looking at all the frequencies so so how many frequencies are being played at time x how many frequencies are being played at time y and i was looking for the the rate of change in the number of frequencies over time i've done the same for all the notes in the piece and i've done the same for the analysis now it is quite interesting looking at these graphs to actually hear the music alongside it um so i'm going to uh, this is this is um this is the full piece I'm not going to play it all, but you'll just get a sense of how this... So these are seconds at the bottom here. Notice this little explosion of chaos here. I'll explain that. But it's interesting how that is offset. Okay, so that's interesting. I'm going to play the one with the noise. Uh, do the same thing. Um, because that's also interesting. So here we go. Because I was curious, this this bottom red line is the noise probe. That's the change in entropy of the noise. And you can kind of hear it 
Um, you listen. So um, I should explain the fractal graph is looking, it's a way of visualizing the relations between all of these variables. So it's like taking many different perceptions and layering them over one another and looking at, okay, so when does one go down and the other go up? Or when do they all go up all at the same time? And coloring in the squares, which represent each variable, coloring those squares differently, depending on what those interactions are. And it produces this pattern and it's a, it's a kind of fractal, and that's that's interesting because um, fractals are very useful for predicting the future. Um, if you've got a fractal, you by definition you've got a pattern which is the same at different orders of scale, which means that um, if you uh, are trying to govern yourself in a particular environment that might be unfamiliar, but you have some memory of uh, a similar pattern of events at a different order of scale in the past, then you can use that as a guide. So this is, this is the augury uh, fractal, really. Um, and um, and actually, that's very close to how machine learning works, which is an interesting uh, um, uh, correspondence. So... Um, what about perception and what about um, order? Well, I think one of the key uh, findings of the 19th century um, psychologists was a recognition that perception was directly related to order and that the degree of perception was related to the way that we could change or make changes to the order of phenomena in the world so you could you could do very simple things and this is where we get things like hearing tests and those kinds of things so you change the intensity of the noise and you're looking for the perceived response in a subject same with eye tests um but fundamentally it is about order and that's why i've been um looking at these these graphs these normal distribution graphs are ways of representing what you've just seen what you've seen in this previous um uh, presentation pre previous uh, representation um but representing it as um normal distributions where those entropy values are basically used as data to say well um for the first section of music there is this normal distribution for the second section there is this for the third section and fourth and the question is whether even on perceiving the first moment whether all the other perceptions are actually implicit because fundamentally they're about our physiology and our relation to the universe. So actually the music is always there. It's all there every time, all the time. Now, um, so this is where we get into a bit of physics um, or uh, sorry, it's a bit of uh, psychology and a bit of history. So um, Gustav Fechner is the man on the left-hand side, and he is famous for establishing the science of psychophysics. Um, he wasn't himself the originator of this, um, but um, th there was another man, uh, um, Weber, um, I can't remember his first name now, um, in the early, earlier part of the uh, 19th century, who initially had this idea that there was a relationship between the physical world and what we perceive. But Fechner is the person who really codifies this and publishes the book, gives it a name. 
and and really establishes this thing called the Weber Fechten law, which um, is still very widely used in medicine, particularly. Fechner becomes Clara Schumann's step uncle because his sister married Clara Schumann's father, and um, although Clara didn't really get on with her stepmother, she um, she was clearly influenced by the Fechner family. So uh, Gustav's brother was an artist, and he actually painted this picture of uh, Clara. So there was quite a lot of there was a lot of um, sort of cross fertilization of ideas. But Fechner himself was is a truly fascinating figure because he as well as really pioneering this study of psychophysics, this mathematical way of looking at perception and its relation to reality. He was a spiritualist. He wrote about art. He was fundamentally, he was deeply concerned with um, issues of life after death and all sorts of things. It was a truly remarkable figure. And, and also he had this, um, it was a struggle really, an intellectual struggle between on the one hand, what we would call a very sort of functionalist, very... Um, operational mathematically oriented practice and on the other side this very deeply spiritually connected um aspect to his his inquiry and he became very influential um later Mahler particularly was deeply influenced by Fechner um uh um uh, partly because uh, Rukert, who Mahler set uh, quite a lot, and Rukert uh, was also um, uh, very familiar with Fechner's work and very interested in his views on uh, art. Um, I got into this with AI and eyes. Um, so we had uh, we had a big uh, EPSRC project to look at um, uh, medical diagnostics, and I'd always been interested in a educational assessment technique which was all about making comparisons between student work and then getting rankings from making multiple comparisons and so we ended up combining this idea with medical diagnostics and ended up creating getting ai to do the comparison and setting up a company and um, and things have, have moved on since then fundamentally the root of the idea that the ai is working on and which our, our whole scientific focus worked on was psychophysics and the work of Gustav Fechner. And I only discovered fairly recently about this connection to Schumann, which really, which really uh, made me feel very happy. Um, and in that work with eyes, and I, I was working with uh, a doctor uh, called David Wong. I don't know if David's here. I can't see who's here at the moment, but um, uh, um we started to analyze the comparison data in terms of normal distributions. And this is this has been very, very useful in terms of improving the AI and improving our understanding of how the computer uh, perceives the images that it makes uh, diagnostic judgments about. And, and fundamentally, the big news story is that AI obeys the same Weber-Fechner law as humans do. And... Um, you might reflect that if that wasn't the case, it probably wouldn't work. But that that's that's a very interesting and important thing. Fechner has coined this phrase psychophysical parallelism as a as a way of saying, well, look, you know, contrary to Kant, actually contrary to Hegel, there is a relationship between mind and body that you can empirically um operationalize. And um the geometric uh, representations I've shown you previously can also be represented in terms of uh, normal distributions and their their relation. So you can say you can draw a line and say there's a scalar, and maybe that scalar is gravity. Um, and on top of the scalar, of course, you have signals. And you might say, in terms of music, well, that might be notes. And the normal distribution is a an indication that somehow. Um, probability is constrained in different ways, and there is a there is a, a minimum constraint at the top, and there is there are various heavy constraints that that squash a normal distribution curve into the shape that it has. Um, and we also have relations between normal distribution curves, and that's the space between them, for example, like this. So you can see all of those 
uh, four ideas um, actually are repeated. Uh, sorry, let's just get rid of that. All of those four ideas are um, that I drew geometrically can also be represented in this way. And that's very interesting because it means that we can do music analysis like this. So here, this is the Schumann piece represented as a set of normal distributions. And I've got, I've got to, um, I can break that down a bit. Let me just find it. Um, so this is actually, this is the analysis of the noise of the piece, which actually creates a bigger, um, a bigger differentiation between the graphs. But you can see, so this is the first, I can't remember, it's about the first 10 bars. Um, this is the next little section. And as I go through, I can see that they, the normal distributions oscillate with one another. They see so you get a you get a sharp one on the left, and then you get a more narrow one. And then you, so this is this is this is these are oscillations in the entropy of perception. So this is our biological system jigging about in different ways at different moments, and. I think the question is whether the jigging about of our perceptual system is necessarily is a fundamental part of the way that physiology works in relation to the physical world. And if that's the case, then it means that the music is always there, basically, um, and that somehow we're, we're enacting something as we listen to um, Schumann, as Schumann even composes something, as biological systems we're engaging this, and this isn't necessarily cultural. This actually could be very deeply organic. So I can keep keep on doing that. Um, just just to sort of um, highlight these dynamics a little bit more. Um, so this is this is the graph I've just shown you. So on the one hand, you from the first to the second, you've got a tendency to move to something which is a bit more diffuse in terms of the entropy. Of uh, of events, so it's, it's no noisier basically, and then from that second one, you've got a, you've got a third section of the music where it's coming back, and on it goes. It goes from left to right, from right to left, from left to right, from right to left. Now, is all music like that? And and if it is. What is it telling us about the structure of the world? What is it telling us about the structure of the universe, about our own physiology? Um, because, yeah, it, 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 we've, we've grown to think it's cultural. I'm not sure. And, and this is the noise component. You can see the noise component is, is, uh, is a bit richer in the variation between the normal distribution curves. But as you enter into any music making, and I've done lots of improvisation, as some of you know. And um, I've, I've thought about, you know, when you start an improvisation, there are patterns and they're not necessarily, they're kind of learned, but they're not. And you you pursue your intuition, your feelings about things, but you end up with similar processes, certainly beginning with nothing and ending with nothing. But even on the journey, it's almost as if it unfolds itself. And uh, this is nearly my last slide. So um, I can't read that now. Where is that? Sorry. Yeah, the imminence. Um, the imminence of music progression in the structure of physiology and physics. Why do we need music? Um, so here's here's Michael Tippett um, asking that question. Oh, sorry. Here's Michael Tippett asking that question. And um, why do we want it? Nobody knows, but human beings need this for some process which, which we I think must use the word soul we want our souls to be nourished and with this they are nourished then we are dead well there we go he, 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 so um, there's not much more to say there really but actually the business of being dead and being nourished is very important because this ties directly into the arguments that John Torday has been putting forwards to say that our agency in music making is fundamentally epigenetic. That means that we're we're doing we're engaging in this behavior as biological organisms to discover epigenetic marks, to discover things about our world which we carry back within our physiology 
to the next generation through the um, the gametes, the sperm and the egg, uh, to make the next egg for the next generation. So the process of adaptation is happening in the zygote. And the phenotype, you and me, are merely instruments of the zygote and music might be a very powerful instrument. So then you kind of, you think about that and you think about the physics that within which that is occurring and the way that the physics affects the cells, the way that physics affects those fundamental biological processes. And you get a different picture about what music might really be about. Why do we want it? Nobody knows, but human and, beings um, need he's this. He's talking again. Let's stop him. Sorry. Um, just for reference, I think uh, this paper by, by John and Bill are here, actually. Um, but I think this this paper is really, really important. I think everybody should read this paper, to be honest, um, because it's saying what I've just said, that the phenotype is an agent. Um, we are not the main show, uh, even, Donald, even Donald Trump. Now, um, so this is the coda, uh, because I think one of the things that I've been, I said the, about the connection to AI, um, I think we might, I think AI is a new kind of scientific instrument. And I think we're at a very, very early stage in understanding what it might do for us, what it might help us see. What I think it might help us see is the actual dimensional reality of the nature that we can only see in our perceived sort of two-dimensional uh, snapshots. Because if it perceives in the same way that we do, if it obeys the weber fechner law, then you can set it about the task of doing things that we simply don't have the energy or the 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 ability to do which is to look at the world in so many different ways that it builds up an incredibly rich picture of the world around us and can inform us about not just about the world but about the nature of perception itself because yeah it because of this relation to the weber fechner law and if it perceives, well, this is what I've just said. If it perceives like humans, it's key affordance is the ability to process huge numbers of possible perceptions as a way of grasping the underlying deeper structure. What does art look like when we can do that? I, I wonder if art becomes a different kind of thing. I wonder if music, music is a very powerful indicator of what might be going on within us physiologically, physically, um, in 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 the physics of the universe it's a very powerful indicator because it shows shows how we sh sort of shake around to in this negotiation between the local and the non-local but if the computer can actually give us deeper insight into how that works i think the way we organize ourselves fundamentally will change and that is the end <laughs>